All right, ladies and gentlemen, we got a big guest today. Some call him a prospect guru. The one, the only, J.J. Zacharyson. Ecstatic to have him on today. Going to be talking about the rookie class. Going to try to combine that with a draft if there's time. Let's see what we can can get into. Let's get it, gang. I'm missing my drop. Here we go. All right, I'm your host, Liam. Today we have on J.J. Zacharyson, a.k.a. Late Round Quarterback on Twitter. The link to find him is in the YouTube description below. J.J., how are you doing today? I'm good, man. I'm good. It's really fun to, to hop on and chat with you. Yeah. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the rookies. I've had a lot of guests on my channel throughout the years, and I've you know I've noticed a lot of them have cited your work so i figured it's time to have on the big dog himself to hear about these prospects learn about the rookies for the incoming uh best ball season i'm primarily a best ball fantasy football player which is intertwined you know with season long and whatnot but um my favorite question to ask every guest and this is kind of funny because you're a huge person in fantasy football and i'm like this like little side corner here but I like to hear about your origin story, you know, because I'm sure you've said this before, but I like to first hear, how'd you get into fantasy football in the beginning? And then where did you, you know, where did that go to find yourself today? Um, floor's yours. Yeah. Uh, so I started playing fantasy in probably, it was 2002. Um, so I've been playing for a decent amount of time. I guess it shows my age a little bit. Like I want, I is, that, is that high school? Is that college? Yeah, was, that... Was, I, I'm, I, mean, I just turned 36. So I was a freshman in high school at the time. Okay. And uh, your mother's maiden name too. What's that? Your mother's maiden name too. Just let me uh, know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Here's my social security number. Um, so yeah, so, you know, I started in 2002. It's actually a league, my home league that I still commish to this day. So we're like 20 plus years in at this point. Uh, and you know, I went to, to school. I went to University of Pittsburgh um, and got my degree there, graduated in 2010. And whenever I graduated, I got my degree in marketing, had a graphic design background a little bit, uh, design and web development background. And so I was like, hey, got my degree in marketing. I'm going to get into advertising and be a cool guy that works at an ad agency and, you know, drinks at a, a kegerator every day and plays ping pong and stuff like that because that's what you do at ad agencies. And so got a job out in Cincinnati where my wife, my now wife, my girlfriend at the time had gotten a job out of school. So we moved out to Cincinnati. I worked for an ad agency that did a lot of work for like Procter and Gamble and stuff. Like I was, I was at one point managing the Swiffer.com website, like as my job, it was the, it was the most like the, the least gratifying thing I've ever done. Yeah, in my get life. Swiffer now they're, they're a household name. Yeah. Right. 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 And so, uh, you know, I did that for, uh, three or four years, but as I was doing that, I just realized that like, I did not like where this was heading in terms of like, you know, just my satisfaction with life. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people like reach that fork at some point. I was just pretty fortunate to reach that fork pretty early on in my professional career. I was like 24 years old. So I decided to write an ebook at that time. This is in 2011 to 2012. Uh, I started writing an ebook called the late round quarterback, which, uh, was basically, I mean, like now it's not that like, it's like an obvious strategy for a lot of people to, to use. I mean, you know, over the last handful of years, things have shifted a little bit in the market and just the way that you should be viewing quarterbacks. But back then we were seeing in redraft leagues and managed leagues, like five quarterbacks from an ADP perspective, getting drafted in the first round and a half of these leagues, like your home leagues. If you guys went and played a, a home league fantasy football league in, in 2011, you were seeing Matthew Stafford getting drafted at like the one, two turn. Like it was wild. Right. And we all know now we're like, why would you ever? It, that's funny you say that. Was my first year. I'm the commissioner in my college league, yeah. and my first year uh, running that league, my freshman year, I took like Aaron Rodgers third yeah. overall or something. Won the league, won the league, but yeah, times yeah. have changed. 
Yeah, exactly. And like now we know that like, you know, you're not going to get that kind of value uh, and upside from a pocket passer like that. Right. And and back then it was it was a thing like like mobile quarterbacks were, you know, you were getting a cheat code from them. Uh, but even still and we saw that with like Michael Vick, but even still people were drafting these quarterbacks really, really early because in 2011 we had the near lockout season. And uh, numbers were really inflated. We actually saw the same thing happen with like the COVID season where things were a little bit different, where offensive numbers just got inflated a little bit more because offenses were just one step ahead of defenses um, in terms of prep and stuff like that. And so, uh, you know, I, that that happens in 2011. I then launched this ebook in 2012 where, you know, it's kind of like a contrarian view and, and against the grain view on fantasy football. And uh, from there, a year after I launched that, I got my, uh, I got a job, a full-time job at number fire, uh, which where I was the editor in chief at this startup that no one really knew a ton about. Um, but we did, you know, analytics and football analytics and all sports analytics actually. Uh, and I just ran the content and such and try to build up the media part of the business. And then a couple of years after that, we got bought by FanDuel. So then I became a FanDuel employee. Uh, and I was there for about seven years, uh, as I've sort of built, you know, my own brand, if you will, and, you know, my own following and listenership and readership and stuff like that with the late round podcast. And then in 2022, I said, you know what, I think I'm done being part of this like bigger entity. I want to just start my own thing. Left FanDuel, um, you know, took my podcast with me and uh, they sponsored uh, some of the stuff that I did for a couple of years. Now I'm doing work with with Underdog, um, which I just announced like literally a couple of weeks ago. Um, but, uh, yeah, so now I'm on my own with late round fantasy football where I'm now my own boss and able to kind of do some of the cool stuff that I've always wanted to do that. I just, you know, didn't have time to do because I was managing things and doing some other stuff with a place like FanDuel. I love that. Um, we love underdog over here. Of course, people wouldn't have probably not even know me if not for underdog It's where I ran hot and took yeah, down BBM too. Um, before we move on the home league, got to know how's the record there. What do the high school friends say when you don't win at all? Are they like, hey, Mr. Big Shy with his fantasy yeah. company over here? Yeah. You know, it's funny. It's really funny. I went through this like insane drought with that league. I mean, like I, I am a successful player. Like I do well in season long leagues and stuff like that. For whatever reason, I would just lose in the playoffs every year in this home league. Like all the time, just cursed out of my mind. Best team in the in the regular season, just got unlucky in the playoffs. I know that everyone says that, but it was like, legit insane stuff going on you know with my with my squads and whatnot like i remember one year i was in the semis and like i needed drew Brees to score like five fantasy points and he just didn't get it on sunday night or whatever night it was a monday night game um and stuff like that was just happening but then there was an article that was written by a a, a reporter for the pittsburgh post gazette which is where i grew up and he wanted to do a feature on me and so he writes the article and at the end, he asked me about the home league. And I'm like, yeah, I, I just can't get this monkey off my back. I had won so many championships early on, but I hadn't won since like 2009. And then two years ago after it was like that broke the curse. And, and that year I ended up winning the league and finally turning things around. And now I'm back. Now I'm back to talking a lot of junk. But yeah, they give me they give me crap all the time. I mean, any, anything I anything I tweet, anything I do on video and these live streams or if I'm like doing a radio spot or like a TV spot of some sort. I mean, yeah, they 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 rip me consistently. That's what friends yeah, do. If, right? I, if I was in your league, I would organize everyone's profile picture to be like different shots of your face. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, stuff like that. The the year I uh I won BBM two, I got last in my home league, and I'm kind of like the Emperor Palpatine of the league, yeah. where mm -hmm. I'm the commissioner, I'm the one who got everyone in there, and you need someone to, you know, to keep people invested. So like, yeah. for some of those people, it's just trying to beat me. You know, just just trading trading poorly yep. just to to rip me off it's it's a good time though yeah um feel that. so you you released the the late round a uh, book and it's kind of funny because i've been an elite quarterback guy these past couple of seasons but this year feels you know at least looking at the underdog draft so far as is as a self-professed elite quarterback lover um i'm finding it tough because it kind of seems like late round is making a rebound where, I mean, you're getting guys like Justin Herbert, Tua, who we know we can spike. Justin Fields was looking okay for a second. And now, I mean, he might be like a 20th round pick. Like that's, yeah. that's pretty enticing in tournaments. So it seems like late round quarterback is making a, you know, a full circle thing here. Um, 
But how did you go from the late round into the prospects? Because let's talk about, seems like prospects is something that a lot of people uh, respect your work for. This is the first year I got your prospect guide, which we're going to be looking at some of um, the graphics you got in here. So talk to us about how you got into this and what your process is like, both at this time of the year and once the NFL draft actually completes. Yeah. So, um, you know, I play in dynasty leagues and I would say that I started getting an interest in prospecting just because of that, probably around 2016, 2017 timeframe. Um, and I realized very quickly that it's a very tough game to beat the prospect game. Right. I mean, there's just a lot of volatility to it. Um, and I realized quickly that a lot of people are wrong all the time and, you know, nothing against, analysts but it's just a very tough i mean nfl teams are spending millions and millions of dollars prospecting these guys and they're wrong all the time right with the way that they're uh, evaluating these players and so i thought to myself there has to be some way that i can sort of streamline this and make uh, a, some sort of like you know backbone for me uh, and process for me to evaluate these players and so what i started doing is building some models right so you know, back in like 2018 time frame, 2019, I didn't really have that much, you know, I was prospecting, but it was more so just looking at pertinent data and relevant data that I knew correlated to NFL success. I didn't put a, a model together at that point. But then in like 2020 time frame, uh, I was like, you know what, I'm going to put a model together because I, I think that that having sort of that baseline number uh, is helpful in knowing, you know, just, just general range of outcomes. Like if, if a guy has a really low probability of hitting or a really, really high probability of hitting. And so, uh, and, and around that 2020 timeframe, I built my first model for prospects. And since then it's just sort of been, you know, I've iterated it, uh, year in and year out, uh, because look at the end of the day, college football data and data in general, uh, with college, uh, it is not very uh, good and streamlined. Like it's, it's yeah. not nearly as deep uh, as you'll get in the NFL even. And even NFL data, like you could argue, is just not nearly as good as it could be. Like this isn't, you know, we're not talking baseball here where baseball is a very one-to-one -one game. Uh, you know, it's a batter versus pitcher type, type environment. This is like, there are literally all these little mini battles going on on a football field at once where it's not the easiest thing in the world to just measure literally everything uh, on a football field. And then you go, look at freaking, you know, like, like Holy Cross or some random school like that. Like, of course, they're not going to have detailed data on their wide receivers and their running backs. And so, um, you know, I've just done a lot of testing with different metrics. Um, you know, some of them are pretty basic metrics. A lot of them in the model are pretty basic metrics, but it's how they all sort of work together uh, that I think brings you know, the, the late round prospect guide, the zap model that I have brings that sort of a competitive advantage because, you know, I think a lot of people are just sort of looking at these metrics and silos and they're not necessarily weighing those individual metrics properly, right? Like a good example of this is a couple of years ago, Chris Olave comes out, you know, with Garrett Wilson, Drake London, that class. And Chris Olave comes out in the fantasy community was like kind of low on Olave because he wasn't an early declare wide receiver. Uh, you know, he went to school for four years. He, he uh, didn't leave early like Garrett Wilson did. And people were concerned because there is signal to early declare status. If a wide receiver leaves college early, that's generally a good thing in terms of talent evaluation because he's leaving early because he's probably good. Right. You know, if you if you're doing something, same thing as like breakout age, and all these breakout metrics. If you're doing something really well at an early age, you're probably better at that thing than someone who does that later, right? Anything, whether you're talking like I made a, an analogy in the guide about playing the piano. I mean, it's no different than that, but it's just on a football field. And so when a guy's leaving college early, it tells us that there's probably some signal there because he probably thinks he can get drafted fairly high in the NFL draft. Chris Olave stays at Ohio State an extra year and really all of his numbers from his final season there didn't even matter for the model and for the model's purposes. So if he would have just come out that previous season, he would have looked like a little bit better of a prospect in my model. But the problem was people were overstating and not weighing properly what that early declare status really meant. And they just started fading him as a result of that. But there was a lot of good to his profile, you know? So yeah. that's what this is all about. It's just kind of making sure that you're not too high or too low in these guys. And you're looking at things in a pretty processed way. Yeah. And um, I mean, I've talked about this before, but my, I was an economics major in my senior year, thesis paper way back in 2014 was or 2015 was trying to predict uh, wide receiver success in the NFL. Right. And so I like I manually got all the combine data. I manually grabbed all these college stats and I ran a bunch of regression analysis mm -hmm. is how I did it. And like initially it was like 
returning terrible. It was like the R squared was like 0.13. And then my, my econ professor had the idea of like, well, we kind of need to control for the fact that like the majority of these people don't play more than like a couple seasons uh, right. or even like one year. And so once I put in this like bootstrap variable that basically assumed players play uh, three years, then actually the R squared got semi respectable. It got like mm-hmm. a point seven and change. You know, I'm I'm doing off memory and like it had hits such as like Stevie Johnson, who right. you know was like a seventh round pick, or whatever. Right. And you know, I was I had hopes that with time data would only get better, right? Because now they have GPS trackers and everything. Yeah. But the truth is, like publicly available data, I think is getting worse because. One of like the only like I can't remember everything, but the uh, one of the only things it cared about for predicting success was uh, three cone time. Mm-hmm. You know, which which makes sense. It correlates with like how well you can run routes, I assume. Um, and then I was also like quarterback efficiency in college, which is probably just like a you know a stand in for like were they in the SEC or something like that. But right. um, now you know players at the combine like half of them don't even run. The three cone, which I'm assuming is the agents being like, "Hey, look what happened!" To like DK Metcalf, Dude, yeah, exactly. Went to like the end of the second round, you know. And right. so there's not a lot of incentive to do this, unfortunately. Um, let's get into your models for a little bit before we kind of look at some of the later round players. Uh, you know, not we don't need to look at like Marvin Harrison Jr. in gang here, sure. who I'm assuming the models in on. Um, are, are you doing? regression analysis is it a uh is it just correlation talk to us a little about it at least what you can share yeah so it's a lot of regression analysis probably pretty similar to your approach and what you did in your econ class to some degree um and really i'm i'm taking metrics that i know have sort of inherent correlation but the problem is so so i'll say this i'll take a step back the problem is that most individual metrics that you're going to find are not going to give you this super robust correlation, right? So if you go and you test something like yards per team pass attempt, there are different iterations and how you can test something like yards per team pass attempt. First off, you know, like, like I think one of the big things that fantasy and anal- analysts and analysis in general in the space get wrong, you can manipulate your data to have a stronger core. Like someone will ask me, Oh, what's your R squared with your model? It's like, that's, it's not really like, like I can, I, I can, I can, uh, increase the the sample within my model to include, you know, right now I just I, yeah, I trying I, to fit the R squared does not necessarily mean yeah. the it's getting better. You're just trying to solve for the R squared, right? And like the very important thing that people I don't think fully always comprehend is that like you can even look at ADP data and redraft, and if you're gonna like look at the first six rounds of redraft leagues and that's your sample size versus the first 25 rounds of redraft leagues. And that's your sample size. When there's 25 rounds, you know, there's this massive long tail that exists where rounds 12 plus everyone's basically, you know, you're going to get random hits every once in a while, but everyone's basically not giving you anything. And when no one gives you anything, that increases the correlation, right? So hypothetically, I could get so many prospects within this model, right? And throw them in there who never will do anything in the NFL. And I know they won't do anything in the NFL. And I grab their names from, some random site like PFF, even though they didn't go to the combine and even though they weren't drafted and I could throw them in there knowing that they're going to score zero fantasy points across the first three years of their career and increase that R squared value. Right. (laughs) And I could be like, Oh, look, I have an R squared of, of 0.85. Look how awesome this, this model is. Right. But like, you know, I I think that working within the parameters is what's important. Right. So the way that I'm measuring things is off of the first three years of a player's career. I call it B2S, which is best two seasons. And it, it takes a player's first three seasons and points per game. It eliminates any seasons where they don't play more than eight games. So half the season, and it will average their top two seasons in, in points per game as sort of the, the metric that I'm measuring against. Right. And so every player in this database, it, it includes every player who went to the combine or who was drafted since 2011. Every player in this database has a B2S has a, has some, average of their top two seasons out of their first three in their league and in, in the league. And, and what I basically set my set out to do was be better than draft capital, right? Like that's the other thing that I think is important is that people aren't testing what they're doing really. And they're also, um, you know, like not thinking about what the model is really trying to solve and what, what they're really, what their goals are. Right. And so 
for me, it was like, if I'm not better than draft capital, then why am I building a model? I could just look at the NFL draft and go, here's the wide receiver one, here's the wide receiver, and just go literally where they were drafted, right? And so um, I started testing against that. I, I immediately was able to sort of beat draft capital uh, without the input of draft capital, right? So I realized that- That's an ever-changing thing, right? Like even, you know, even two years ago, it seems like wide receiver is becoming more and more important to the league and and- evaluators are realizing this, right? Like we're seeing them go higher in the draft and we're kind of seeing running backs go lower in the draft, right? So you have this Mm ever-changing meta of where players go and you're trying to solve for something where you may have thought it was stable two years ago. And now it's like, well, but they might be taking inputs that you thought they weren't. And now they're, now they're, you know, using those. Yeah. So, so basically like I I'm testing against when once players play three years in the league, because I'm testing against the first three years of their career. Once they play three years in the league, that draft class then goes into the testing and I can see sort of where things are at. And, and, you know, I always love it whenever the model like gets better after a, a, a class ends up graduating, if you will. And then like gets like thrown in from a testing perspective. I'm like, oh man, this just got stronger, which means the predictive nature of this model is working right now. Right. Um, yeah. But, but like, yeah, I mean like, like people get a little bit irritated that like I'm, I'm testing things every off season and I'm changing things up and stuff. I'm not changing things up to like, switch my results and changing things up because the NFL is changing, right? Like the way that people were valuing certain positions, uh, certain archetypes is very important. Like smaller running backs, smaller wide receivers, uh, you know, might end up being a little bit more useful, you know, not just this year. You're trying to improve your process. Yeah. Right. I'm trying to be better and more accurate for that current season. Right. And so I'm not overfitting or anything. I'm literally just saying like, Hey, I'm, 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 testing again. I'm also getting new data, right? So I want to test that, that new data and, and new ideas. Like I have a, a fantasy point score, I call it for wide receivers in the model this year. That was brand new. I just didn't think of it before, you know, like of using fantasy points, basically like a market share fantasy points metric. Um, but like I hadn't used it before and I thought about it. These are my shower thoughts these days. And, <laughs> you know, I'm like, I'm getting out of the shower. I'm like, man, I should. And I immediately go to the computer and I just start messing with it and seeing if, there's any signal to it. And then I just kind of go from there. So to me, it's, it's more about like, you know, always testing this stuff. Like I have a good baseline with what I'm doing, you know, with, and anyone can look at the baseline and and start looking at yards per team pass attempt as a wide receiver metric, total yards per team play as a running back metric. Uh, You know, and then you can look at, I have a thing called breakout score now with wide receivers and running backs where it shows sort of age adjusted production at those things uh, with with those things. I like that, that comment there. Um, yeah, yeah. But like, you know, I, 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 uh, I, I think that a lot of people could do this. And, uh, I think that a lot of people should, if you're interested in like prospecting in general, you know, I, I've, well, it's a, I mean, it's a lot of work. Right. And I, sure. I didn't ask that question to like, be like, well, you know, why is your model good? I was just trying to, no, no, I like, I dude, just I like, talking, like I can sit here and talk about the, like the, the, thinking about the inputs of these models, like a lot of it comes from me having read a lot of stuff through the years, whether it's like a site like Rotoviz, who really did a lot of the data analysis stuff with prospecting. And they were at the forefront of it in the fantasy space way, way early. And so, you know, it's just like piggybacking off of what other people have discovered and then coming up with new stuff yourself. Um, And it's really, really fun. Like you're discovering things that that you can't wait to share with people. That's what's really fun about the prospect guide is like, I'm the only one mostly who's seeing this thing before it gets released. And then people get all excited about it. And it's like, it's a very fun, it's like a, a movie premiere, if you will. Like it's like a, a cool thing for folks to get excited about and us to nerd out about. I mean, it's the nerdiest thing in the world, but it's really fun. Yeah. Let's talk about um, some hits you're proud of that, hmm. you know, the, at, just give, give me one player at each position. You know, like Isaiah Pacheco, I associate that name with you. Yeah. Um, a couple of, a, a year ago, um, I heard rumblings of that. What are some hits you're proud of that other people may not necessarily have been in on? And then I think every, you know, dissecting last year, talk to me about Puka Nakua and Tank Dell, just those two players, and what, if anything, your model was saying about them and what. Yeah. If, if there's anything to learn from them, really. Yeah, yeah, actually, I think there definitely is. So um, in terms of the the hits, um, I think the Pacheco thing, like like one of the things that I even talk about in the guide and like the intro and stuff is that it's really important that this isn't there to say this is definitively how things are going to go, 
right? Like people associate, like you said, people associate me with Isaiah Pacheco because I was pounding my chest being like, Hey, go get Isaiah Pacheco. And I know that in like, it sounds like I'm, I'm just patting myself on the back by saying this, but it was, you know, you just look at my tweets and stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm saying, you know, go draft Isaiah Pacheco, go draft. I wasn't sitting there saying Isaiah Pacheco was going to do this, you know, like, like, I, I think yeah. that's, what's very important is that like, this isn't about being totally, totally accurate and correct. This is about being better than the market, right? This is about being better than what others are saying. And at the time, Pacheco out of that draft was a fourth round rookie pick, which is nothing, right? If anyone plays dynasty, I mean, it's literally nothing and you could get them for free, you know, in, in best ball drafts too. And so, um, you know, it's one of those things where like the model just pointed out and saw that he had a really good speed score, you know, weight adjusted 40 time. He had an un, un, underrated receiving profile. You know, a lot of people saw his efficiency marks at Rutgers and they were turned off, uh, but Rutgers had a pretty bad offensive line and efficiency numbers really don't correlate nearly as well at running back or a wide receiver as just raw volume type stuff does. Right. And so the fact that he had reasonable enough marks across the board uh, and then he had that speed score. And then I also do statistical comps where one of his comps was Damian Williams, who crushed it in the Kansas city offense. I just brought that all together and I'm like, let's go, right. Let's let, let's go for it. Like there's a lot of reason to buy into him right now. Uh, back in the day, Aaron Jones was a big hit, um, but it was, he was a big hit for a lot of people who, who, uh, who prospect via data um, wide receiver last year. It really liked Jaden Reed more than the market did. Um, so I'd probably say that's one that, that jumps out to me. Wide receiver is one where it's very difficult because wide receiver, you don't get nearly as many, out of nowhere hits as you would, you know, I know that we saw and, last and that's year. changing in fantasy, right? Because I, you know, when I started playing best ball, T Higgins and chase Claypool were like 20th round picks, right? Yeah, sure. Those yeah. players would be six round picks today, you know? Right. And so, some of that was the coat, like a, a legit narrative in fantasy that year was, Oh, you can't draft the rookies. They're not getting training camp. Right. And I was like, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. So I'm yeah. Like, you know? Yeah, the, the the funny thing too is that like from like a market trends perspective, rookie wide receivers in particular are like amazing bets to make in redraft, right? Like not, not only that, but for best ball and for tournament purposes, like late in the season is when they typically surge these these rookie wide receivers, and that's exactly when you want them to surge. Obviously, in any kind of format, but especially you know when the stakes are as high as they are in best ball tournaments and such. Um, but yeah, I mean like like when you're talking draft capital and where these guys go, you know, like Claypool and, Hig and Higgins were second rounders, right? You're, you're going to, and so they look decent, like there's a draft capital input in the model. So like those guys inherently will have some baseline because of where they're drafted. What I'm more concerned about then is how much they, do they, uh, or how much volatility is there and how much variance is there from that baseline with that player? That's why I have a metric called draft capital Delta, which is basically showing me the risk profile of, of a certain player. And so like, like Alec Pierce, for instance, a couple of years ago comes out, second round pick my my stuff hated him right and so i'm like i'm not gonna have alec pierce anywhere don't draft alec pierce he was drafted where he was because of athleticism and so um you know i then uh am, am able to use the model as sort of like that baseline to say okay i'm gonna like him more or less than the market will but a guy like that will still have like he's not gonna be like a 50th percentile or fifth or have a score of 50 in the model because he was a second round pick but very rarely you know like puka nakua last year even Tank Dell, who did, who had decent enough draft capital, like his draft capital wasn't that bad because he got drafted in the third round. Uh, but a guy like Puka Nakua comes out of nowhere, day three pick. We don't usually see day three wide receivers do much, let alone have one of the greatest, if not the greatest rookie wide receiver season ever. The one takeaway I had with Nakua is my model deals mostly with yards per team pass attempt at wide receiver. And that's a metric that correlates very strongly to yards per route run. But there are some blind spots with it and the reason I use it instead of yards per hour runs because data is more readily available, right? For like historically, so I can do better testing with it. And so, um, but but with yards per route run, Puka Nakua last year actually had an unbelievable yards per route run profile. And that's a metric that does correlate to NFL success. It's just not in my model. And then his his yards per team pass attempt was kind of low. It wasn't, it wasn't horrible, but it was low. We're seeing that a lot this year with Lad McConkey. Lad McConkey has like a bottom five yards per team, best season yards per team pass attempt in this class, but he has a top five yards per route run rate. And people are like, well, how is that the case? Well, you go and you dig in. He was fifth in Georgia, Georgia this past year in, in routes run, 
And it was because he was banged up. Georgia would get ahead in games and they would rest players. And so he's not able to accumulate the volume that you would ideally want him to accumulate. Now, Lad McConkey looks okay enough in the model because I have things like teammate score and he went, you know, he played at Georgia. He gets a little bit of a bump for that, all that kind of stuff. But like Puka Nakua, he didn't look bad, especially in the new Zap model that I have. But like, uh, it wasn't like a screaming buy. Like I drafted him yeah. in a decent number of, of leagues just because he was a fourth round pick and he had what seemed like pretty immediate opportunity in LA, but it wasn't this like screaming obvious thing from a model perspective, but he did have that yards per route run, you know, metric that you could latch onto and say, look, not a lot of guys going this late in rookie drafts have anything, let alone a really elite yards per route run rate. And then with, with tank Dell, I mean, my model still, I, my model now in terms of the year two model, which projects how well a guy's going to do in year two and year three loves tank Dell. Like I, I, I love tank Dell. I think he's legit. I think he's a great pick everywhere. Literally any like format. Top 10, top five, real wide receiver talent. If you yeah, like, like he's in analytics, loves him. He's like yeah. he's legit. He is super, super legit, but I, I I'm not going to lie. Like I even up, you know, I, I upgraded and updated the model uh, to the zap model that I called it this year. And he still doesn't look that great. There's a lot of marks analytically that he just, and it's not even size related. Size isn't even an input in the wide receiver model. It's really, he's an older prospect. You know, he didn't come from this massive program. His draft capital was fine, but it wasn't elite. You know, there's just stuff that the model didn't capture and it's not always going to capture it, right? I still have some, again, yeah. like when, when you're talking like, you can't you know, make a one size fits all, you know? Yeah, of like, course, of course. And I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm not ever going to run away from, a miss because I know that holistically this thing is going to beat the market. You know what I mean? Like there's no reason to be like, Oh man, because tank Dell, because the model didn't capture tank Dell, I got everything's wrong. It. You know, like yeah. we got to scrap this thing. It's like, no, I mean like that's, that's going to happen. Like I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to be as high as I should be. Like I wasn't as high as I should have been on Rasheed Rice last year either, where, you know, he came from again, not this like massive, massive program. He didn't really, have great production until late in his career in college. Um, you know, we, you know, I think a lot of people were into him because of the Kansas City landing spot, which is fine to give him a little bit of a bump, but like there were red flags to his profile. And I'm going to still use the same kinds of red flags that were to his profile as someone else. It's just that things ended up working out. He ended up hitting, and a lot of the traits that he had in college, like his yak ability and stuff, stuff like that, it was able to translate. And so now we have what Rasheed there's Rice like, is now. There's that two sides of the bell curve meme, and you're on like the smart side with like the <laughs> the model, and I'm on the other side being like, well, he was really fast at the combine, right. so I'm gonna draft him, and then right. he landed in the Chiefs, and I was like, well, hey, that that one worked out. Right. Um, that's cool to hear. Let's let's uh real quick try to you know I think at the top of the drafts a lot of people have heard about you know a lot of names here, and so. Rather than let's start with quarterback, I do you do, you do quarterbacks with the model? I don't have a quarterback model. No, All right, so, well, let's just, this is your quarterback vibes. These are JJ JJ vibe slash yeah. model takes, and this is what this is fantasy points to be clear. Yeah, after let's just talk about QB4 and QB5 for you. Who are those at this current point in time? Are you buying this JJ McCarthy? round one steam, or is this like a Will Levis slash Malik Willis situation of the past? Who are you going with? So I'm buying, I have McCarthy at four and then I have, uh, I don't remember who my five was. I think it's, there's yeah, Bo Bo Nicks, there's I, have Bo, Nicks, I, have, there's... I have Bo Nix at five right now. Bo Nix. Um, there's, there's actually a lot of, of stuff like Bo Nix is really good at, uh, you know, his, his pressures, uh, avoiding pressure and not, not taking sacks per pressure. Uh, which is something that does translate whether it's, you know, it doesn't make you automatically a good quarterback, but that statistic translates very well from college to the pros. It's like a Justin Fields thing, right? It's the same. It's the reason why teams don't, didn't want him uh, on the open market or semi open market uh, over the last month. But uh, that's where Jaden Daniels is a little bit frightening too, where you could see like the Jaden Daniels comparison and corollary to a Justin Fields type is because he was really bad at taking sacks per pressure. The JJ McCarthy stuff though, you know, I, I think from a best ball standpoint, I, 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 or a redraft standpoint, even just like a 2024 standpoint. I mean, he, I, I took him in best ball. Like I, I took Hertz in a stream last night mm -hmm. and I took him as my second quarterback in the 20th round. Yeah. I, I mean, like, here's, you know I, what? Seems like. It, I think that if, if McCarthy, like one of these guys is, is looking like, and it's looking like it might be McCarthy 
is going to go to Minnesota, right? And that's that's the spot to me where if McCarthy finds himself there, which I think is becoming increasingly more likely with the draft capital they just accumulated, uh, you know, with that like later first round pick and uh, using their own capital. So many ways that up. could go. That could be like a trade up to three. That could be a, we don't want to take them this high. So we want the, like the flexibility for sure. Sure. 10 or whatever, you know? Yeah. I, but I do, I do think that I, I do the, the, the steam and the, like it's happening with JJ McCarthy. Like he, he is, he's going to go in the top 10 in this draft at the very least, I think. And so yeah, like the next quarterback that goes after McCarthy is like Russell Wilson, which is like, come on. Yeah. In, from that perspective, that from that perspective, I think it's totally fine to go that route. I just, I, I think that if, if you're going, obviously if you're going to, go that route. You got to do what you did with like a Hertz or you got to do what you, or get a, get a trio and feel good about it that way with one of these. Yeah. 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 Not as a guy you count on, but you know, a fun guy. Um, the top of the running backs, it kind of seems like the top two have solidified, uh, for most people I'm hearing Trey Benson and I'm hearing, um, who's the guy towards ACL. Help me with that. Jonathan Brooks. Jonathan Brooks. Are those the top two for you? And then let's talk about, uh, running backs three, four, and five, and we'll pull up a graphic of one of these guys. Yeah. So Trey Benson, uh, is currently my RB one, but I don't feel great about it. I think there's a lot of glaring, uh, issues to his profile in general. Um, where th this class in general is not very good. Like the, the, the running yeah. back class, I think there's enough like spots and we know that RB twos in fantasy football, like, I mean, we know that there's gonna be a, a plenty of split backfields across the league. And so like, these I mean, guys gotta be that good. You're you, one of them's gonna be the Cowboys starter, right? Right, exactly. Like, like they're, they're number one, there are some landing spots that are totally great right now, right? But then number two, even if they find themselves in a in a destination where they're splitting a backfield, they can still either emerge from that backfield or still give you some production to be worthwhile in best ball or in fantasy in general. The 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 thing with Trey Benson is his breakout score, which is a metric I use. Um, it was totally average. It was like 48, 50 is the average. Um, and then his his best season in total yards per team play was 1.36. And so I and his and his best season reception share, which is another metric I use at running back, uh, is below 10%. And historically, if you look at poor breakout scores, so you're looking sub 60 breakout scores, reception shares below 10%, and then you look at players who are drafted day two with those two filters. You get Alex Green, this is since 2011, Alex Green, Stephen Ridley, Kristen Michael, Carlos Hyde, Matt Jones, Damian Harris, and Trey Sermon. I mean, it's just bad, bad after bad after bad. And so with for me, Trey Benson, his top comp that got spit out, which I think is pretty fair, is Kenyon Drake, where, you know, maybe we see or one of those last seasons. Pick. Yeah, like, like we, we saw him have a big season before, and we know that he's athletic enough that he can break off some big runs. But I do think there's a lot of volatility to his profile. And then Jonathan Brooks, I think the fear, if, if Jonathan Brooks didn't pair his ACL, I think he'd be the consensus RB1 in this class. Yeah, um, that's what I'm hearing too. And, and he's got he's got a lot of, of good marks in the model and in the stuff that I look at um, just from a production standpoint. You know, he played behind two legit pros in Roshan Johnson and Bijan Robinson in college too. And so uh, with Brooks though, the fear is just, when's he gonna potentially step in and see a big workload, right? Like, like when, like, like, is this going to be a situation where he's sort of redshirting and like, we're not going to see that much production from him in year one, or is it a situation where he really truly, you know, his camp is saying that he's going to be ready by training camp, uh, which I don't fully believe, but, um, you know, I, I, I do think that we have to at least look at that and take it with a grain of salt is that Brooks has at least a chance to not be uber productive in year one because of the ACL, but hopefully you know, you might get some get get some playoff magic from him, and yeah, uh, I mean, you know, he's I, back. He's back. He then, feels like you know? a buy to me at the moment, but I don't. I don't have a great read on the injury situation mm -hmm. uh, and how it'll play out. So that brings us to running back three, four, and five. How about you just give us three names here, and then we'll pull up one of the prospect spot uh, yeah. prospect profiles and talk about that guy. In particular. yeah, I have I have Braylon Allen, Blake Corum, and Jalen Wright back to back to back there. Braylon Allen. Yeah. Uh Break Blake Corum, who is a very popular name. Yeah. And then who's the fifth? Jalen Wright. Jalen Wright, who exciting speedster. And which uh which player do you want me to pull up here? 
Uh, let's do Braylon Allen because I think he's probably the most interesting in terms of what the model is sort of saying. Uh, he is a beast from a size perspective. Um, he has really interesting breakout uh, metrics and related metrics because he left high school a year early and he went to college and he played running back. At, he was recruited as a defensive back at first, like a sort of like a safety, I think, hybrid uh, linebacker hybrid. And then he decided to play running back at Wisconsin, where we've seen plenty of successful running backs come out of. And he goes and he breaks out as a freshman. And he has this monster season as a 17 year old freshman. And he's like 235 or whatever. Like he's this massive dude. The problem is twofold. He didn't see his production get exceptionally better. You like to see growth, obviously, you know, during a collegiate career. His didn't get exceptionally better. And then on top of that, um, he is this bigger bodied guy, but he had a little bit of trouble forcing missed tackles. And you know, you don't want to see that for a, for a bigger bodied player. And a lot of people that watch film more than I do uh, have, have recognized that he's not necessarily the bruiser that you would expect from a guy that size. And then he's apparently had sort of this like high ankle issue throughout the off season. So he hasn't run his 40. He's not going to run his 40. And so at this point you have to wonder, you know, is he just not very straight line speed fast? And that's, yeah, he's faking that. Him. He's yeah. slow as hell. He's faking that for sure. Yeah. Right. Right. Like you got it. You got to question like what the heck's going on with that. So I, you know, Braylon Allen, the model is going to like him. There's no doubt because there's a lot of good marks. The breakout score is elite. The, uh, the it, size is awesome. Could you just give us like the 30 second, uh, recap of what zap score is? It's a, it's a combination yeah. of several of these things, right? Yeah. It's a combination. So a running back, it's a combination of, uh, if I can think off the top of my head, age uh, is is an input. Breakout score, which is age adjusted total yards per team play for for a player. Uh, reception share, which is the percentage of in, in their in their top season, which is the percentage of uh, receptions that a player sees within his offense. Uh, and then size, so weight is a is an input. Um, where once they, I think over two twenty five, it doesn't matter anymore. So they don't they won't get like credit for being like two hundred eighty pounds or anything like that. But yeah. <laughs> um, they do get some weight there. And then speed score is another one where if they're fast at their weight, that does get some signal. And that just and goes into a zap like score the, of zero to 100. And if the higher, the better. What was like a zap score for Bijan? Uh, 99 last Nine? year. Wow. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, then, and then Jameer Gibbs was 98. So this class, so right now, Braylon Allen has the highest zap score. This is based on projected draft capital for the record. So yeah. where it's at right now at 89, it's going to change based on where he actually gets drafted because I'm just projecting draft capital based on uh, NFL mock draft database.com. But uh, no running back right now has a zap score over 90, which would be the first time if that ends up happening, that'd be the first time that's happened in the database history, which goes back to 2011 that we haven't had a running back get to a score of 90. Just to give you an idea. I don't think the running back class lacks depth per se. I think that there's just no obvious elite player in it. Yeah, that that seems to be the popular sentiment. Yet there is opportunities out there. Um, wide receiver at the top three feels pretty set. I would say four wide receiver four through six start to become a more interesting discussion. Uh, let's do the same thing here. Give me three names, and then we'll pull up um, a visual on one of them. Yeah, right now uh, I have Xavier Worthy and sorry Brian Thomas, then Xavier Worthy, um, and then. You could make the argument either Troy Franklin or Lad McConkey. Uh, you could even go with AD Mitchell if you wanted to with that. With yeah, that those space. are the three names I've seen a lot. Yeah, like you could go. You could go. Let's just say. Let's just say McConkey right now as as okay. the six. Um, and, who, and who do you want to pull up here? Uh, let's pull up. Let's pull up Worthy. Worthy's interesting. The Brian. Yeah. The Brian Thomas thing is just like, it's the, you know, it's the Terrace Marshalls of the world. It's like. Oh, oh yeah, not that. <laughs> you know? Brian Thomas is scary because a lot of his metrics look pretty nice in the model. Like he's scoring pretty well, but his, his there's no like op, like good matches from a comp standpoint. Uh, his top comp was actually Quentin Johnston, uh, and then there was oh, like no. like Terrace Marshall was in there as as a oh, comp. No. Like, like his met, but but those guys. The, the difference is like the, the model did not like Quentin Johnston. Uh, in hindsight now did not like Terrace Marshall. I, I didn't have it, you know, with Terrace Marshall in that class, but, um, so like the model didn't like those guys, but from like a size and relative production standpoint, he does match up fairly close to those guys. And then the difference between 
Brian Thomas and Quentin Johnston, though, is that a lot of Quentin Johnston's um, contested catch stuff was, was pretty poor. And Brian Thomas grades out and looks a little bit better with those metrics. He uses his size better than QJ did. Right? Johnston was also just slow. Like Yeah, right, right. I think Brian Thomas is just a more athletic and does know how to use his size. But like he could be what we wanted Quentin Johnston to be or, or you know, football fans. Just At worst, know. seems like a, a downfield burner. You yeah, know, like right. Burner. Like, like Martavis Bryant or something like that. Yeah, like that, like that, that I think is like yeah. a reasonable outcome for Brian Thomas. Now, do you spend a first round pick in the real NFL draft on that? I'm not sure. I think he's still somewhat of a project, but um, you know, I think he has a pretty high ceiling in general uh, in the, in the league. Xavier Worthy though uh, is interesting just because the size is uh, you know not there, and um, I think does it say what's his weight on there? Does it is it one sixty five? It says one sixty five. Yeah, yeah. So um, maybe generous. Maybe that's what some <laughs> yeah. yeah. So obviously, like a really small frame. But then you look at his comps, you know, Marquise Brown, Jordan Addison, Jahan Dotson couldn't have way worse comps than that. And then a lot yeah. of people are, are a lot of people are going to comp him to John Ross because of the speed factor and what he did at the combine. But uh, Xavier Worthy has the third best breakout score in this class behind neighbors and Marvin Harrison. He his freshman season was pretty um, unbelievable, all things considered. Now, you do run into the same issue as like a Braylon Allen, if you will, where his production didn't get any better. Uh, a lot of the numbers that are being used in the model for besties and stuff are from his freshman year. And Texas got more competition because A.D. Mitchell transferred to Texas. And so now all of a sudden, like, you know, you have to wonder, okay, Xavier Worthy's numbers didn't get any better per se, and he got more competition. What's going to happen when he's in the NFL and he has NFL competition, right? I do think he's good, though, overall. The model is going to love him uh, because of that that great breakout score, which is why he's at a 94.8. Anything over 95 is when you start to get into like pretty elite territory for these guys. So if, if Worthy goes in the 20s in the NFL draft, he could be close to that 95 mark, which is I think where he was like, he, I think right now with 94.8, he was projected at like 32nd, 31st overall or something like that. What, what um, was uh, Jamar Chase app? And is there any chance this is the next Tyreek Hill or is that too? I, no, no. I mean, like, I don't think you should ever comp to Tyreek Hill, obviously, but I think that if you're going to pinpoint someone to be that archetype, Yes. Like you need Xavier worthy to literally just be different, right? Yeah. Like, like beat you deep, beat you in ways with speed that we just don't see because he's not great against press. Like he's not a standard wide receiver. And so uh, I do think that, that you're going to need a landing spot for worthy too, that you can feel confident in, uh, you know, like if he goes to Buffalo, Oh my God. Like if he Ooh. goes to Kansas city, my God, like, like that's the perfect kind of pairing. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I still think that he is good enough and better than, you know, a lot of the, like people have been throwing out there that like all these like super fast wide receivers at the combine have been bad. Cause like yeah. the guys who have run sub four, three or whatever, sub four, four forties have all been bad, yada, yada, yada. Okay. But none of them had breakout scores nearly as strong as Xavier Worthy's breakout score. And if you really want to look at uh, a, a group of a larger sample of wide receivers to, to get players who did have breakout scores that were comparable. Then all of a sudden you're looking at guys comp like closer comps of like Chris Olave and Garrett Wilson and players who like, we forget that they were really fast at the combine too. You know, like this yeah. isn't unique. I mean, it's unique to Xavier worthy. Cause he was like next level fast, but like, yeah, you, like people are punishing him for being too fast and being right, like, John Ross. Yeah, 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 right. You can't like it. Just doesn't make any sense to be like, oh, he's too fast. Like, no, that's this ridiculous, right? Yeah. Um, so I think Xavier Worthy. I mean, he's someone that I've drafted on underdog uh, a good bit. Like, I, I like taking him over, you know, like the AD Mitchells, uh, you know, who are who are in a similar range right now. Yeah, and um, I read something interesting today that the turf at Colt Stadium is pretty fast, and so. Worthy might uh, for sure go down as the record holder um, mm, because they they're switch. replacing that turf with a slower turf. And so going to be going to be tough to ever beat his four two one. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, tight end is for a long time. It was a two tight end class. And then one guy popped out like a 10.0 Raz profile relative yeah. athletic score. Um, you know, there's. Bowers and there's Sanders. Who is your tight end three? And maybe even a four if you're feeling out there. 
Yeah, I mean, I do have Theo as my uh, as my three. Theo Johnson. Um, he's sorry, he's actually, three Theo Johnson is actually my two right now. To be clear. oh okay, yeah. he's, he's jumped Sanders with this bad combine. Yeah, so Sanders didn't have so like my tight end model is still pretty fresh, and I'm I'm only uh, publishing the the post draft results of it because I only include tight ends who are drafted in that model. Um, but last year, I'll be honest, like you don't want results to totally dictate like how you you know, do things the following year and stuff. But like I built the model last off season and I was sending email, but like newsletter blasts out to, to subscribers, uh, which is free by the way, but I was sending them out and I was talking like through the tight end model as I was building it. Cause I wanted people to sort of understand, you know, what I was doing and, and why I was excited about it. And the tight end model freaking love Sam Laporta. Like it was so into Sam Laporta and because of the, and it, and it loved, like it loved the class in general, but it was like Laporta is the tight end one Dalton Kincaid is the tight end two. And it really liked Luke Musgrave as the tight end three over uh, a Michael Mayer. And so I saw the results and now I'm just like, screw it. I'm just going to, I'm going to publish Let's do these. it. Let's do it live. I'm just, I'm just going for it. Maybe this is going to be a horrible idea. Uh, historical results look pretty good. Um, but could, the only thing that could bite you is because that was supposed to be a special tight end class. Yeah, exactly. and so like if this is just like a lukewarm class, people yeah. are gonna be like, well, what's this class? You know? Yeah. It, well, it's going to be like, I, I don't think, I mean, Brock Bowers, of course, like Brock Bowers is arguably, right how does, ba how does Bowers comp in the model compared to Laporta and Kincaid? Yeah. So it depends on where he'll end up going. Right. If he goes in the top half, let's of the pretend first top 15. Yeah, if he goes top 15, he's going to be the second best tight end in the model behind Kyle Pitts. And th this goes back to 2015. So, um, you know, he's he's looking good. But, uh, you know, the model definitely, like, it captured uh, Mark Andrews as a really, re like, it liked Mark Andrews more than Hayden Hurst, the model did, whenever Hurst went above Mark Andrews to the Ravens in the draft. So, like, that was good to see. Um, yeah. Laporta, though, I think Laporta had a score of, like, 96, 97, something around there. Bowers is going to be in the, uh, 98, 99. So okay. he, he he will be will be better. But to me, uh, there's no tight end. There's only two. There's two tight ends that are in the 80s right now. Uh, that's Theo Johnson and Jaheim Bell. Uh, and then J uh, Jatavian Sanders is right. He's at like 79. So like they're all kind of clustered together. I don't have Jaheim Bell ab ab above Sanders in my pre-draft rankings because there's some size concerns. Like I think he's just going to be kind of this hybrid, uh, kind of different different type. Like maybe like a like a Brevin Jordan type uh, tight end. Whereas, you know, Sanders, I can see playing just more of a traditional role. And then Theo Johnson could end up just being a freak, right? The The issue with Johnson is his, his college production is just not there compared to like a Sanders. How does he compare to, I'm going to say a couple names here. Okay. And you might up. not even know all the, I, I highly doubt you know their numbers off the top of your head. Yeah. Um, Zach uh, Kuntz. The guy that he also had like nearly a 10 got drafted by the Jets last year, sat on the bench. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the who's the Colts tight end? I'm forgetting right now, athletic freak Jelani Woods. Oh, how, Jelani does, Woods. how does he compare to those guys? Because we've seen these like freaks get drafted, and then I think Woods just got like unlucky with injury. Um, yeah. and Kuntz, like, but maybe was not good, slash, you know, tight end sometimes does take a little bit of time. Yeah, so Kunz doesn't look that great because his draft capital is pretty poor. It's two twenty. Um, so he had a score of he had a score of twenty two. Zach Kunz did, which is Ooh, okay, okay, not, not the best. Jelani Woods had a score. I like that this is like real time pulling this stuff up. If I could type, uh, Jelani I'm still Woods. Believer in Jelani Woods, but I don't know if I should be. What's that? I'm still a believer in Jelani Woods, but I don't know if I. Oh, I love Jelani Woods coming out. He also destroyed Pitt whenever they. Uh, yeah, Jelani Woods had a score of 91. Um, oh, okay. So he was looking pretty good. Some of that is driven by again he had 73 overall draft capital. So I think that that if you're gonna have a comp for a Theo John, like I haven't done comps for tight ends because I'm not writing profiles up for them and stuff. That's yeah. probably more the Theo Johnson comp is Jelani Woods. I I also think though that like if you're talking Woods like they they had a very very uh clear rotation at tight end where i don't think that you know just from the way that they ran that offense that he it's really was ever to get that fair of a shot either um but yeah i mean like we also also, also have to remember that like the prospecting tight end and tight end in general is just really tough because we're really basing it off of a handful of guys who become elite yeah right like 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 we're only worried at, like like if Theo Johnson ends up being a tight end too, we don't care at all. 
it doesn't matter, right? We, we need our, we need these players to be legit, you know, top six, top seven type tight ends to give us some sort of difference in, in every format. And so unless you're playing like two tight end leagues or, uh, you know, crazy premium type, type tight end leagues, but even then I would say only two tight end leagues, it really matters. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm going to just chase upside from that perspective. And I do think that when we look back at this class, chances are we're only going to look at Brock Bowers as, as a guy who has that legit kind of plug and play tight end upside. Yeah, I agree. Um, but you know, there are some teams with like, you know, if like a Theo Johnson or a Sanders lands with like the Bengals competing with like Mike right. Sticky and gang, right. you know, that's pretty appetizing. So tight ends coming out of the woodwork sometimes. Yes. Um, well, thanks for talking through this with me, JJ. I don't know what time you got on your end. I was going to rip a draft. We can either rip this draft together or we can thank you for your services until next time. We'll leave that. Yeah, I might have to I might have to jet because my daughter is going to be getting home from school and I gotta be a dad and very fair. Well then let's, off the, the bus let's, and all let's zoom stuff. out for a second. And um the link to follow JJ is in the YouTube description below. But JJ, tell the people where they can find the rest of your work here. Yeah, I'm on I'm on Twitter at late round QB. Uh and then you can find my stuff over on lateround.com. All right. JJ, thanks so much for coming on. Looking forward to chopping up with you yeah, later. Man. And congrats with the new partnership with Underdog. Thanks, man. Really appreciate it. It was a good time. All right. See you. All right, guys. So that is our rookie class discussion um, to start here. Really thank JJ for his time here and talking through um, some of his model, some of the players here. It's good, you know, um, comparing... Now let's compare this with because I I did a rookie talk with um I did a rookie talk with Jacob Sanderson. Now he gave us these ranks before the combine took place. Um, and what I want to what I was interested in is Braylon Allen because uh, JJ's model quite likes him. Um, Sanderson likes to do it via tape. So he like tape scouted a lot of these guys. He says Braylon Allen is his least favorite. Uh, so, and, but he did note that some hot have him as high as the 101. Blake Corum, uh, he was also pretty into. And then Jalen Wright, he gave us the RB6. Uh, and that's RB5 for JJ. So pretty close there. Wide receiver, of course, the combine, I think, changed things for Worthy. But... Um, Jacob went Brian, Troy Franklin, and Ladd. And then JJ went Brian Thomas, Worthy, and McConkey. Um, and then, yeah, we didn't get a tight end three, three through five. And yeah, I mean, these are like a lot of the names I'm hearing in the mix here and also seen um, in the market here. Guys like Worthy, Coleman, um, didn't have the best combine. Lad, Troy Franklin, Brian Hot Thomas, Ad Mitchell. So cool to see the alien. What did what did we get for quarterback four and five? He gave us McCarthy and Bo Nix. Um, although maybe I forced Bo Nix because Davis came on and hated Bo Nix. So we are going to add the draft here. I'm jumping in now. If you would like to draft against me, drafting for two hundred k. Up top. I don't know why I cannot join on my computer, but joining on my phone here. People are saying do a draft. Patience, patience, people. I'm jumping in there. Going as quick as my thumbs can move. Okay. Four more. I'm going to refill my water and be right back.
Oh, crap. Forgot the water. Okay, here we go. Did a nice stream last night too. Talked quite a bit about the Bears and Justin Fields trade, if you have not seen that. Pulled the 108. Now's a good time as any to say, if you have not already, please like the video and subscribe to my channel. I'm on the road to 5K subscribers. We're getting there. And if you want to join my Discord to chat some fancy football, the link to join is below. Judy, three-year extension, yikes. Let's pull that up. I'm not seeing anything. Let's see if Underdog's got it. Jerry Judy signed a three year up to $58 million extension. Well, I mean, I guess that answers. Um, do Puka. I guess that answers how the Browns view the wide receiver room, you know. As far as Judy versus Elijah Moore, would I pay that to Jerry Judy? No. I don't think Jerry Judy's that good, but maybe he turns it around. Let's see, where's Judy going? Jerry Judy. An ADP of 133 after Rashid Shahid, before Jahan Donson. So that's like end of the 11th. It's not a bad price for him, to be honest, but I, pr I think I prefer Shahid, you know, as far as like an explosive downfield threat. Um, but if Judy had a great season, I guess it wouldn't be that surprising, especially because... You know, Mark Cooper's no spring chicken if something happened to him. It's a great question. What's good, chat? Why are we not all smashing that like button? Okay. I feel like a Puka and Nico start is just good fun. We had some Nico haters in late night last night's stream there. Um, someone saying that, you know, he's not even the best wide out on his team. I don't disagree. I like Tank Dell as well, but, you know, Nico should have a really strong start to the year and, of course, can still have good weeks down the stretch. Brandon Ayuk, rumor. There was a rumor from a Jags reporter. Um, That said, Mia O'Brien, who covers for the Jags, I don't know, like I don't, I don't know how big she is or whatever, but she said, as I noted on XL Primetime, 49ers reportedly would have wanted number 17 overall plus Zay Jones, then Jaguars would have to pay Ayuk. So a Niners trade rumored for, um with the Jags for the 17th overall pick and Zay Jones. And I mean, I think that's a slam junk. If you're the Jaguars, that's like roughly what the Bills spent on Stefan Diggs. Now you could say Brandon Ayuk has not shown quite the level of a Stefan Diggs. That's 
it's probably fair, but I also would think that Ayuk being, you know, not being surrounded by so many options, maybe he would shine. I think Ayuk is a stud wide receiver. I think that would be a great move for the Jaguars getting your number one wide out. You still have Kirk. You still have Gabe Davis. Um, that just seems like a great fit with Trevor as well. So I would do that if I was the Jags. Um, yes, you have to pay him. Big deal. You got to pay people. You know, I think that's a it's it's good to allocate salary cap to stud wideouts. So I you know, and I don't know if that's true. She could have been making that up. Another thing I asked today is in any given NFL season, what percent chance do you give the below tier of quarterbacks at winning the Super Bowl? And I'm talking about the Tua, Kirk Cousins, Jared Goff, Geno Smith. Maybe Geno Smith doesn't belong to be here after his down year, but the year before people would have lumped him in. Um, and I said, these are the decidedly good, but not elite quarterbacks that require super teams to de defeat the Mahomes, Josh Allen's Burroughs. And I think it's a very low percent chance, you know, just like looking back at what's happened. It's like the elite almost always rises to the crop. Now, we do have a weird talent disparity where most of the elite quarterbacks are in the AFC. Um, I think Dak's a little bit, Dak's above this tier for me. Um, Dak's like, like Matt Stafford's above this tier. Dak's, you know, Dak's like in that Matt Stafford in tier, a little bit below her. Um, but most of the elite quarterbacks are in the AFC. So I think the chance of like Tua reaching the Super Bowl is near 0%. Like just the chance of the Dolphins beating both a healthy Bills and Chiefs and Bengals team seems very low. Um, and Ravens, you know, but one of these quarterbacks will probably almost by default reach it by the NFC. So like in the, in the sense that, you know, any given team in the NFL probably at worst has 25% chance, 30% chance they got a chance to win it. But, you know, we'll have to see what happens with Caleb William, Jordan Love taking that leap um, as far as whether any elite quarterbacks can emerge in the NFC. And then what I found funny is, you know, people who know my content know I, uh, let me make a pick real quick here. It's a pretty good price on Chris Olave, pick 32. Sam Laporte is interesting. Malik Neighbors is interesting. We're going to go with Olave, you know, like, and then I want to talk about something else. But what I found funny is, Rant like and bear or lions Twitter, which like I talked about the lions being, you know, a dynasty. Like I'm a, I'm into the lions and this guy's like Goff is not mid, which by the way, I, I said he was very good. And then some other lions fan was like, <laughs> these, these lions fans are just coming at me, calling me. I don't know ball and everything. I'm like, come on guys. Like, He's not an elite quarterback. If if the Lions had an elite quarterback, they are for sure in the Super Bowl and probably win the Super Bowl last year. That's how good the surrounding team is for them. Um, at least on the offensive side. Latest rumors for Marvin Harrison Jr. Uh, looked at a Daniel Jeremiah mock. I don't know if I would even call this rumor or if he's just doing this for clicks, but he had some fun moves in here. Um, he had the Vikings trade up to 104. The Jets trade up for Marvin Harrison Jr. And then Malik Neighbor goes to the Giants and Odunze goes to the Bears. Odunze. So, yeah, I mean... It really feels like Marvin Harrison Jr. will be either a Cardinal or a Charger, possibly a Jet in that trade-up. Um, you don't want him to be a Patriot, but it's possible. Okay. I mean, Cup's tempting, but 
I'm going to be a little bit of a coward with the age. I think I'll just take Lamar here. The running backs are fine too. Um, but getting my first share of Lamar. I got three stud wideouts that are young. And I got a quarterback that can go for 30 points. You know, I, I'm on record of saying I do not believe that Lamar really belongs exactly in the tier of Josh Hurts and even Mahomes always. Um, and even though I did take Lamar over Mahomes, but that's in a consistency way. Like he's a better and best ball quarterback, meaning even with Lamar, like I went two QB with Hertz. Lamar, I think fits better on three QB teams. Um, especially with Derrick Henry there, just because you get so many 10, 11, 15 point games from Lamar, you really need what happens when he plays teams like the Dolphins last year, where he goes for those 40, 35 points, um, which is not always, you know, to go with two. So with Lamar, long story short, 20 rounds, I'll probably be going three quarterback. Um, I've also seen rumors that other, you know, I think these people are clickbaiting, but people are talking about neighbors ahead of Marvin Harrison, which I guess neighbors is like getting talked in the same breath as a Jamar chase, which that's pretty interesting. Say wide receiver, please not wide out. Okay. Vocab dude. Henry round three. I mean, I don't know. I don't think it's so bad. He was round four. Augustus asked a good question. Would be good for Jags, but why give more capital for Brandon than you would have given up a second rounder to retain Ridley? Is Ayuk that much better than Ridley? I think it's a combination of Ayuk, yes, being better than Ridley and also being that much younger. You know, Ayuk is 26. He just turned 26, by the way. So he was 25 last. Jeez, what a, did Brandon Ayuk's son pass away? What was with that first one? Um, Ridley turns 30 this year. So, yes, I do think giving up a first, you know, giving up the extra round of draft capital makes sense for getting a guy um, four years younger. You know, it's a little too simple to think like this, Stefan. I don't think Henry round three is bad, but isn't it bad in the big board since he was going uh, rounds fifth through sixth most of the time the tournament has been going? I mean, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, going from a fifth to sixth to a third is really not that prohibitive. You're getting a, you're just getting a unique contexture of teams. Um, I give up the example of Daryl Henderson, like when he went from like round 15 to round four, that is too prohibitive to me. You're just getting a different uh, combination of players. Whereas like they would have Henry, let's pretend they have like a Henry Waddle and T Higgins versus your Henry T Higgins and Trey McBride. You can be on the good side of that. You know, it's, it's getting the extra fifth slash sixth player and needing them to be good. Wow. Um, I mean, Mahomes is here at 48, but I already have Nico. So, whatever. I'm just going to do it. I would not do this a lot. However, pairing these two seems fun. Getting a huge discount, even giving up the stack. Um. And I like Mahomes to have more fantasy consistency next year, assuming they add some weapons. I mean, they already did with Hollywood Brown. Obviously done at quarterback.
you know, most of the times I would not pass on Stroud to pair Nico, but that's going to be super common. So this way can win if Stroud gets hurt late in the season, if Nico goes for 100 yards and a touchdown, and Stroud only has 15 points, Mahomes rushes in some touchdowns. I'm liking the oldies. This is a very young team. Puka, Nico, Olave, Lamar, and Mahomes. I don't count quarterbacks as olds. Yeah, so I, I gave up the stack of Stroud just for the uniqueness combo of Lamar and fifth round Mahomes. And now I will stop at two, by the way. Like Lamar and two, Lamar and late round guy is usually three for me, but the the week to week consistency of Mahomes giving me the high floor plus ceiling combo feels good. Okay. Um, a lot of different ways to go, but I'm going to take a running back here. And yeah, I'm. I just can't get away from Kenneth Walker's week to week upside. I mean, like maybe Joe Mixon is a safer volume bet and touchdown bet. And he, he does pair nicely with the Nico picks, getting a little bit running back wide receiver correlation. But I'm expecting Seattle to want to establish the run with the Ravens DC taking over as a head coach there. I do think Charbonnet has earned a bit of a role, but, um, you know, just that home run speed from Walker. It's pretty nice when it hits. A lot of the tight ends went before my picks. If Kyle Pitts was there, I'm I'm taking Pitts instead of Walker. As tough as it is as it is to pass up on some of these running backs, like this dead zone of running backs, quote unquote, from like this is considered the dead zone. Like these are some interesting clicks. This is not like Mike Davis, you know. This guy going for a pretty heavy Buffalo stack. Seems fun. I like every draft, a lot of wideouts off the board. Hurts double stack over here. Hollywood did not make it back to me. Um, probably would have taken him just to get the stack. Don't know if I'll have Mahomes stacked. Kelsey off the board, Hollywood off the board, Rice off the board, Pacheco off the board. We got Dog Walker on Underdog Fantasy. If you want to further support the channel, consider becoming a YouTube member by clicking the Join button. That will get you access to the Premium Discord. Where we can chat ball. How do you feel about the Chicago and Tennessee backfields? I'm interested in both. You know, um, where where is Khalil Herbert playing, by the way?
Ah, so he still is a bear. I wasn't sure if last year was this last year. Right? This is this year? Yes. Um, well, it's a little bit sloppy in Chicago with three names in there. Um, I think Swift is obviously the one. In Titans land, I'm viewing Pollard as the one, but I think that split will be very close. Tajay Spears and Pollard have very similar abilities. Um, yeah, Herbert could definitely be on the move for cheap. But, you know, what's he going to go for? JSN, discount on him. I'm going to go Pollard. Um, I quite like Pollard at this price. I feel like he'll have the edge on goal line duties over Spears. He won't have to tout the rock as much. And explosive dump offs are still in the range of cards for him. I think he showed more to end the season there. Um, but yeah, Swift, I like. I don't really know about Roshan. Fantasy wise, like you might pass block, but and then we'll have to see what happens to Herbert. So we got Lamar and Mahomes, Ken Walker, Tony Pollard, Puka Nakua, Nico Collins, Chris Olave. Could this be the $200,000 team? Be pretty fun. Probably going to have to go volume at tight end here. Eric says... I don't like any of the Chicago running backs, but we'll probably wind up with a bunch of Roshan Lee. Yeah, I need to see how it sorts out. Um, but, you know, playing alongside Justin Fields versus Caleb Williams couldn't be much different, in my opinion. All right, whatever. JSN picked 90, ADP of 70. I don't understand why his ADP is in the 70s, but... Eighth round, I can just kind of, rather than making a stand on any of these running backs, just kind of let see what happens there. I don't want to be drafting a lot of them anyways at that price, so if this was an anomaly, good to get a share. Pairs well with the Ken Walker pick. And yeah, I mean... I don't know. He at least showed something, right? Like, this was not like he wasn't like Sky Moore. He wasn't like Quentin Johnson out there. Year two. Any good things to say about the St. Pete Beach area? Heading out there with some friends in a few weeks? It's awesome, man. Go hang by the beach, go hang downtown. Options are limitless. Samir White creeping up to round eight. Makes sense. I still think, I mean, we know what the Raiders want to do. They could for sure draft Trey Benson. I think Jonathan Brooks makes sense as a Raiders destination where they let Zamir White tout the rock, you know, to start the year, run him into the ground. And then Jonathan Brooks is there.
Okay. Looking at pick 104 here. Tajay Spears. Interesting. Let's go Xavier Worthy. Just find out what comes back to us. We just talked about Worthy with JJ. You got me excited about him. I, I do agree that people are just being like, hey, John, John Ross sucked, so Worthy will too. A little too simple, you know. You think top one inside top 100 is too rich for you with white? Yeah, I mean, I need to see what, like if he escapes the draft with just um, with just Alexander Madison as comp. That's a very good sign. If they add a running back rounds three through five, that's not so great. But you know, th this dude was a f a freak athletically. That's why I've drafted so much of him the past two years. Nine eight two. This was like to start my early best ball drafts in like May. I was like the contrarian one. Like I was like the only one taking Zamir White in every draft. And then towards the end of the season, he started getting taken a lot of drafts. So didn't end up being a contrarian pick, but he was contrarian as far as May contextual teams. So I feel decent about my wide receiver depth here. Three studs to borderline studs. An interesting rookie, an interesting second-year player. Two elite quarterbacks. Two spike weak tight end, I mean running backs. Don't have tight end yet. Um, not gonna lie, it's tempting to just take Justin Herbert too and be like, now I got three studs, look at me. But we're not gonna do that this time. I am gonna take Trey Benson. I could do the Tajay Spears thing and have double Tennessee backs, but I'd rather have access to another room. Getting the rookie running back one or two feels decent in the 10th round. Did Madison sign with the Raiders? Yes, he did. Bradley, who I'm assuming took Zamir, says, I didn't want Moster or Brian Robinson. I'm a Raiders fan as well and love me some Zamir. Yeah, I mean, I get it, man. It's like it's a weird range where I do think Zamir will creep up in this range, right? Because it's like you can convince yourself on some of these guys, Javante, Moster, Eckler, Chubb, Brian Robinson, Chase Brown, Zach Moss, Moster, Trey Benson, Jonathan Brooks, like, some of these people, players will for sure disappoint. And some could be some real gems. Oh my God. Detroit Lions Twitter is going off. <laughs> they like, they found, they found this, this tweet where I did not call a golf elite where he's not. And their fans are coming out of the woodworks.
Like these people are just having a full blown conversation about going to PF Chang's in my mentions here. Mama Courts, Courtney, Detroit Lions in bio, says, Taxis Guy says, Good work, partner. Earlier, none of these comments focused on the important points, the Jared Goff slander. And now they all are, as they should be. And then he goes, I literally have no clue who you are. Please stop tagging me and shit. And she says, I was really looking forward to our productive business luncheon at PF Chang's. He says, we aren't allowed anymore. After someone started Jared Goff chant. What is going on? Is he talking about Sam, Adrian, Carlos? What are these people just having this little like troll conversation? I don't know what's happening. No read on the Denver running back situation. Thoughts? I mean, Javante and McLaughlin seem like the favorites at the moment. Okay. Well, uh, we're starving the beast. I just can't. I'm not allowing these teams who might be outpointing me at different positions to also get Jaden Daniels, who. You know, people are talking about him in the same breath as Lamar and Anthony Richardson. So now I have three Spike Week King quarterbacks. Feels like, I mean, Daniel should go ahead of Jared Goff, Trevor Lawrence, Tua, Purdy, Caleb Williams, maybe Jordan Love, maybe Prescott. You know, it's like, what do people need to see that he runs before he does it? And, you know, I guess I'm just going to have to sacrifice a little bit. Um, at tight end or wide out depth or running back depth, but I have enough options and, you know, high end talent there that I feel good about doing that. And, you know, people might start drafting the Baker Mayfields of the world, allowing talent to fall to me. Lad was in discussion there for me, Curtis Samuel. A lot of players to like. Don't feel like there's one clear thing to do here. But I am going to take Keon Coleman this time. Another rookie. Another end of round one. High end of round two. Discussion? Pairing Charbonnet with Ken Walker I thought was interesting. A little bit better price than doing the Pollard and Tajay Spears pairing. Also, maybe a better team for running back points.
Jalen Wright, I was interested in as well. Just out of the speedster. I do only have three running backs. We got a 3 3 6 0. Thoughts on Quentin Johnston? See any possibility of some second year improvement? Well, I can tell you my tweet about Quentin Johnston went viral where I kind of shit on him, but I don't know. It's not impossible the man takes a leap, but I don't think it's very likely. If he is by, like if they don't draft someone like Malik and or sign someone and or draft a couple other guys and he like falls into volume, I, I guess, but. You know, I I'd rather take Josh Palmer than Quentin, who does who does go right ahead of him in this draft. It's got to go Aaron Rodgers, starve the beast. Um, I'm going to take Darnell Mooney. Great landing spot with Kirk. You know, could have, <clears throat> you know, he could be like a, their version of like Jordan Addison in that offense. Right, where it's like Drake London is the Jefferson ish, Kyle Pitts is the Hawkinson ish, and then Mooney is um, Addison ish. You can say what you will about the different talent levels of these players. And also, you know, they have the eighth overall pick. So edge rusher is probably their biggest need, but they're, it's not impossible they add another weapon. But, you know, I don't. I don't know about paying um, Mooney all that money. But, you know, it's not like they, pay, they didn't pay him crazy. Three years, $39 million, $26 million fully guaranteed, which is pretty fucking crazy. More money than Gabe Davis, although it's pretty similar. Um, more money than Curtis Samuel. Keon Coleman has a chance to go to the Chiefs or Bills. Absolutely. So we do have seven more picks here. Um, I'm going to take Ty Chandler. Like he's, he's clearly the RB two there. He's also clearly falling in drafts versus his ADP, but Aaron Jones does have availability concerns. So I think that means that they should both give Chandler some run and Jones could get hurt. And, yeah, I mean, Ty struggles to do some things, but he's explosive at the least, so. Flu! What's up, Bindles? Yeah, Eric, I talked a lot about Fields yesterday, but, yeah, I'll definitely be buying if he remains in the late, late rounds.
A lot of really nice stacked teams in this lobby. Yeah, not a surprise for a March draft. My team not so stacked, but it's what it is. Who needs stacks when you're just drafting the best players? Mahomes, of course, could land Worthy or Coleman. Wouldn't Worthy be fun? Um, Lamar, I don't really care as much about stacking. And Jaden Daniels, also not as stack-dependent. Jones goes end of the 14th. Titan is not going to be fun on this team. And I think um, I might stop at seven wide receivers. Just kind of need to. I get six more picks to play with. At least three of those are tight ends. And then it's like, would you rather have seven running backs or six? And I kind of feel like this team would rather have seven. And just live with... You know, like this team kind of goes through Puka, Nico, and Olave with spike weeks from the other four. And if I don't get those, I lose. I guess I'll take likely. Need tight end. Andrews could be slow. I thought likely played well. Um, Andrews could be slow and or just like not rebound. Nice to have a little bit of a stack. Like. As an independent decision, I think I like KDOT and better. But that's just kind of like safety, you know? And on this team, I think it makes sense to add likely. How hilarious is it that Conklin, who I've like always been a Conklin guy, has three straight years of 87 targets? I mean, he could have a big year with Rodgers uh, remaining healthy there. Rodgers is not like a huge tight end guy. He did support, um, can't remember the guy's name now, though. 
to some good years. And Kong Kong kind of feels like a safe guy to give me some 8 to 10 point weeks, which this team will take a tight end. Juwan was another tight end I considered. I believe Darren Waller's retired, by the way. I think that's official, so. Not recommend you draft him. I mean, A.J. Dillon's been brutal, but he did sign back to the Packers. Josh Jacobs backup had a lot of carries might just fall into a role even in a brutal year 600 yards maybe he gets a little bit more wiggle hard not to I'm going to roll the dice on Theo Johnson, the athletic freak. Hope it works out. This room kind of screams like four tight end. But I might just live with like the likely Conklin pairing. Hope at least one of them hits in an upside way. If not Theo Johnson hitting down the stretch and take the extra two darts at running back.
So the team so far, Lamar, Mahomes, Jaden Daniels, Ken Walker, Tony Pollard, Trey Benson, Ty Chandler, A.J. Dillon, Puka Nakua, Nico Collins, Chris Olave, J.S.N., Xavier Worthy, Keon Coleman, Darnell Mooney, Isaiah Likely, Tyra Conklin, Theo Johnson. First time you drafted with me, turn the notification bell on and you'll get notified for my streams. I also notify my Discord when I'm going live. So you can join that in the link below. Glad you had fun though. I'm going to go with Dylan Lobby, mainly because I grew up in New Hampshire and he was UNH's running back. Pass catcher, don't know what draft capital he'll get. Taking some real darts here to end this bad boy. Let's go with this guy. Isaiah Davis. Went to South Dakota. So don't know what draft capital he'll get, but seems like he's in the mix to get drafted at the least. And that finishes my team. A 3773. Seven, seven, Lamar, Mahomes, Jaden Daniels, Ken Walker, Tony Pollard, Trey Benson, Ty Chandler, AJ Dillon, Dylan Lobby, Isaiah Davis. 
Puka, Nico, Alave, JSN, Worthy, Coleman, Darnell Mooney, Isaiah Likely, Tyler Conklin, Theo Johnson. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. Say something nice in the comments. Have a good day.